Okay, um, welcome to the first video lecture of the forms class. In fact, the first video lecture I've ever given in, um, wow, 30 years of teaching. I'm doing it with a glass of wine, a really full one, um, because it's after midnight and I am not on school property. So uh, that might smooth things along a little bit. Um, I'm going to send you, when I finish this, a few poems. They'll be the poems I'm going to talk about in this lecture. So I hope you can have them printed out so you can read along. It'll make more sense that way. And um, when we talk on the phone next, um, when we talk about your sonnets, I... Um, I hope you'll think a little bit about what I've said in the lecture, a little bit about the readings by Paul Fussell, and in a kind of broader sense, um, the reading by Adrian Rich, um, both of which you should either have read by now or will read after you see this. And I hope everybody's staying, staying safe. Um, I just have a few points scribbled on a shopping list here that I want to talk about. Um, and the first is this, um, by way of getting into the sonnet and what the sonnet is, I wanted to recap a little bit about what we said free verse was and one element in particular of free verse, which is this, that free verse is not inevitable. And when I say free verse is not inevitable, what I mean is that free verse doesn't conclude in the same way that a sonnet concludes. The sonnet has 14 lines. Ideally, each line has 10 syllables. Therefore, on the 140th line, syllable of a sonnet, on the 14th line, on the 10th syllable of the 14th line, the sonnet has to end. This is a way of saying that a sonnet has encoded within it its own inevitable conclusions. I think that's an important thing to remember about a sonnet, is that it has encoded within it its own inevitable conclusions. Free verse does not. Free verse begins when the poet decides the enactment of thought that takes place in the free verse poem begins. Most of the time, 95% of the time, the feeling a good free verse poem creates in a reader is that feeling of listening in on the interior thoughts of a highly intelligent mind, that is, if the poem's any good. It often feels as if, for instance, a window into that mind has been opened just a moment before the poem began, and then we begin to hear the thoughts of that mind as it wrestles with a probably unsolvable problem of some kind. And I don't mean a problem like um, I'm having a problem, you know, with the brakes on my car, or I'm having a problem figuring out how YouTube works, which um, the latter of those is true. Um, I mean a problem that is in some ways larger and unsolvable most of the time. We're talking about problems like the problem of love, the problem of God, of mortality, of futility, or war, or coronavirus. <laughs> um, Probably we're talking about those kinds of problems. We listen in on that mind as that mind thinks about a large and unsolvable problem. And then at a certain point, not inevitably, but at a certain point, the window closes, right? And we're exited from the poem or we're ejected from the poem, if you want to think about it that way, instead of in terms of a window closing. But one of the things that free verse also has, and we've discussed this a little bit before, um, and I'm going to start to paraphrase the poet Denise Levertov, who I was talking about earlier today with one of my students. Um, one of the things I think Denise Levertov realized, uh, she's a very famous poet and critic, but um, uh, is this, that one of the things that makes free verse poetry get, offer us this sense of a mind at work on an unsolvable problem is because it manages to do something in literature that most other art forms, or we can say all other art forms are incapable of doing. 
that is free verse particularly and we're going to talk about this with sonnets in a minute i promise you but free verse particularly is able to um, acknowledge the fact that a lot of our best thoughts take place without words in them anybody who's ever thought long and hard about a problem will re remember that there are points in their thinking where they're not really thinking with words maybe they're thinking with feelings or um they're intuiting something in a kind of wordless way and the great free verse poets have recognized that a free verse poem is able to distribute throughout its silences um, wherever the free verse poet wants to and the, by silences i mean line breaks stanza breaks white space you can scatter the words across the page but as we do that, what we're most often doing is creating the kinds of silences that exist inside of a mind before those silences reach words. That is, before unarticulated thought becomes articulated thought. And the free verse poem contains plenty of both. So one of those things that Denise Levertov recognized is that part of the free verse form was a distribution of possibly rhythmic, but not necessarily, silences to suggest how the mind that we're listening in on that the poet has created on the page pa passes through thought both thought that has words in it and thought that doesn't so when i said in our last couple classes about free verse that at the end of the line we often feel a mind reaching outward before it comes to the words that begin the next line below it that's what i'm talking about or when i say something like you know, that stanza break, that's a pretty really good stanza break because I can sense the thinker in this poem trying to understand maybe what she just said in the stanza above and then realizing what it was and continuing below. Okay, that's free verse as we've talked about it. And I'm gonna have a sip of wine. Wow, that's terrible wine. Um, we also talked, um, or I, rather you read just recently, an essay by Adrian Rich called Format and Form. Um, you can think about this in two different levels, this essay, and this too is going to have something to do with sonnets. Adrian Rich proposes that there is such a thing as a formatted language. And formatted language, she says, is a kind of language that is often used to sort of keep us down keeps women down, it keeps people of color down, it keeps probably all of us down in one way or another. And formatted language she sees partly as, as a kind of a cliched or formatted political language that we encounter every day in political ads and that kind of thing. But she also begins to ask, you know, what does format really mean? And when we're talking about sonnets, I think we often begin by thinking we're talking about format. And what she ends up saying and believing in when she's talking about format is this. The way you say something, the structures that you use to say a thing, whether they are grammatical structures in speech or ideas for how a five paragraph essay might work or ideas for how a sonnet might work. The structures that we choose to say things in, those architectures, if you want to call them, or formats, often determine the kinds of things that we can possibly say. I mean, this is a kind of a radical thing to think. I mean, to realize that, for instance, the structure of a sonnet might in some ways determine what it is that you are able to say within that structure. Now, Audrey Rich goes on in this essay, I think very interestingly, to talk about breaking format, like a bunch of poets who resist format, who write within format, but secretly undercut those formats. I think it's all very interesting. I'm not going to talk about it too much now, but I think you should probably be interested in it. And she goes also on to talk about the avant-garde um, and uh, how the avant-garde is in itself participating in a kind of format, even as it seems to undercut it. Um, and the avant-garde generally is often written from a position of great privilege. That's interesting that she says too, and I'm not gonna go into it. What I wanna go into and what's implied by this essay is simply that the, the format you choose is going to, in some ways, try to control what it is that you're going to say and you can either give in to that which is fair enough if we're writing a sonnet or you can try to resist it and I'm going to look at a few poems that give into it and a few poems that try to, re to resist it but form 
creates argument, format creates argument. I want to keep that in mind as we talk about the sonnet. Okay, another sip. It's still bad. We're going to talk about two kinds of sonnets. There are several kinds of sonnets. But in the wild, when you meet a sonnet, 99% of the time, it's one of these two kinds of sonnets. You know, so that's why I want to talk about these two kinds of sonnets. You can read up in the Paul Fussell chapter about some of the other kinds of sonnets if you're interested. And we're going to look at one sonnet that's a little bit weird. But the two kinds of sonnets are these. There is, first of all, the Shakespearean sonnet. It's often called the English sonnet. Ideally, this is the format. It's 14 lines long. Every line is an iambic pentameter. And it's going to contain three quatrains and one couplet. So if you remember from class, a quatrain is a line of four, or a stanza of four lines, and a couplet is a stanza of two lines. So 140 syllables, 14 lines, three quatrains and a couplet. And the quatrains have this rhyme scheme. A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. That's the those are the quad. That's the that's the, the Shakespearean sonnet. It's really easy. It's good for certain kinds of arguments. Okay, when we talk about a Shakespearean sonnet. They tend, if they're any good, to give in to this particular way of making an argument. They make a point. Stanza one, quatrain one. They further the point. Quatrain two. Stanza two. They continue to think about the point, quatrain three, stanza three, and then they stab you in the gut. That's the couplet. The couplet is where the poem turns, right before the couplet, in that invisible space that Denise Levertov would suggest is the space where we sense the mind thinking before it reaches its thought, the poem turns. So that's how you want to think about what kind of arguments an English sonnet or a Shakespearean sonnet can make. Well, they can make the kind of argument where you think, you think a little more, you think a little more, and then you say something. And hopefully what you say is unexpected from what we've been thinking about. But when we think about it, we can see where it came from nevertheless. Okay, that's, that's how to make an English sonnet. There's going to be a big turn at the end. And the lines everybody's going to remember are the last two, the final rhyming couplet. Another way of thinking about this is that the rhyme scheme in an English sonnet, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G, for the listener, what the listener hears is rhymes that come separated by a line for the first 12 lines. You hear a rhyme, you hear a word, then you hear another end word, then you hear a first end word that recalls the third, that third end word that recalls the first end word, and the fourth end word that recalls the second end word. So the rhymes seem to be coming at a reasonable distance from each other. And then at the end, the final, the final couplet, GG, the rhymes come right next to each other for emphasis. I'm going to read you a Shakespearean sonnet by the great poet Gwendolyn Brooks. We've read a lot of Gwendolyn Brooks in this class, I think. Um, this is her sonnet called Ballad. Well, that's confusing. It's a sonnet called Ballad, the sonnet Ballad. Oh, mother, mother, where is happiness? They took my lover's tallness off to war, left me lamenting. Now I cannot guess what I can use an empty heart cup for. He won't be coming back here anymore. Someday the war will end, but oh, I knew when he went walking grandly out that door that my sweet love would have to be untrue. Would have to be untrue. Would have to court coquettish death, whose impudent and strange possessive arms and beauty of a sort 
can make a hard man hesitate and change. And he will be the one to stammer, yes. Oh, mother, mother, where is happiness? Anybody who reads this poem can hear how the argument progresses through its four qu rhyming quatrains and its final couplet. One can hear that the poet asserts, asks where happiness is in the beginning. We learn in the middle about what she means to be untrue. Untruth becomes coupled with the idea of death and the way the threat of death changes a man. And we have that wonderful couplet at the end I talked about. And he will be the one to stammer, yes, oh, mother, mother, where is happiness? A shocking couplet in a poem that develops in directions that I don't think anyone who reads it expects. I just want to leave that here on the side, hovering as a good example of a Shakespearean sonnet and one that pretty much obeys all the rules. I want to read now an Italian sonnet. An Italian sonnet is a, quite a different species from a Shakespearean sonnet. I'm going to read it first, and I'm going to talk about how an Italian sonnet makes arguments. This is also a really famous one. It's by William Wordsworth. The world is too much with us, late and soon. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away, a sordid boon. The sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours and are upgathered now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. It moves us not, great God, I'd rather be a pagan, suckled in a creed, outworn. So might I, standing on this pleasant lee, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn, have sight of Proteus rising from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his wreathed horn. If we say that an English sonnet slowly builds an argument, only to undercut it or twist it or pervert it or explode it in some way. An Italian sonnet does quite a different thing. Italian sonnet consists of two sections, not five, four. The first section, called the octave, is an eight-line section of rhyming iambic pentameter. Here you can hear the end rhymes, soon, powers, hours, boon, moon, hours, flowers, tune. Um, so it's A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. And then it has a sestet, which is a six line stanza. And here you can hear the rhyme scheme of the sestet, B, worn, Lee, forlorn, C, horn. So it's, oh, go, you know, D, E, D, E, D, E. Um, this is a quite a different architecture, and as Adam Rich would say, it leads us to a different kind of argument formation. The Italian sonnet, if it's any good, is probably going to be doing this. It's going to be making an observation in the first stanza. Probably it's going to be meditating on that observation. It's got eight lines to do it, so more lines than it has in the second part of it. So it's a, often a slightly expansive um, observation, um, nevertheless pressure fitted to fit into eight lines of poem, poetry, which is not a lot of poetry, that we're going to have that silence. And as Denise Levertov has suggested, that silence is going to suggest to us a mind thinking about what it has just thought. So that silence there, the mind thinks about the eight lines that preceded it. And then the mind speaks to those eight lines in six lines, okay? Or responds in some way. Um, here in the William Wordsworth poem, he begins by offering a description of the way we relate to the world. He says, the world is too much with us. Late and soon getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. You know, we spend all of our time, I don't know, wandering around in the world, not really participating in the world, but having it with us too much, nevertheless. We have given our hearts away, he says, a sordid boon, the sea that bears her bosom to the moon. 
the world is too much with us. In these pauses in that silence, you can feel the mind in this poem thinking about those previous lines, and then the mind reacts with anger. It moves us not. Great God, I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn. So might I, standing on this pleasantly, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn responds with anger, a legitimate response to the, to the previous observations, but nevertheless a surprising one. But anyway, I just want to put those two poems there as good models. You can look at them and you'll find a lot in them to think about. But um, both of them do their jobs perfectly well. They're terrific poems. When you're writing the Italian sonnet, the sestet is always the hardest part to write, the second part, because you've got to do an enormous amount of work in six lines, responding effectively to something you had a lot more space, eight lines. Eight lines is a lot more space than six lines, eight lines to set up. Um, and again, you also have to surprise us and you have to keep to the rhyme scheme and the IMs. Okay, so that's the Shakespearean sonnet and the Italian sonnet. You're welcome to write another kind of sonnet if you want. You could write a Terza Rima sonnet if you want or any of the other weird species of sonnets. But I just wanted to get these two out there so you can think about how sonnets generally function in the world. Um, now I wanted to look at um, two other sonnets, one briefly and one in a little bit more detail. They are both legitimately of the Italian sonnet species. They've been written as Italian sonnets for a while, but they contain an odd little um, kink in them in that they also resemble Shakespearean sonnets. That is, they're sonnets that are trying to have the best of both worlds. So I wanted to offer these as um, another option for you. That is, you can write this Shakespearean sonnet that takes play, that takes advantage of some of the, I mean, this Italian sonnet that takes advantage of some of the things that a Shakespearean sonnet offers you. We'll get one poem briefly and another poem in some depth. The End of the World by Archibald MacLeish, now a largely forgotten poet, who at his prime was um, one of the most famous poets uh, alive in America, sort of towards the beginning of the 20th century, in the first half. The End of the World. It describes a circus um, as a metaphor, I believe, for, for the world. Quite unexpectedly, at Vassero, the armless ambidextrian was lighting a match between his great and second toe. And Ralph the lion was engaged in biting the neck of Madame Sussman while the drum pointed and Teeny was about to cough in waltz time swinging Jocko by the thumb. Quite unexpectedly, the top blew off. And there, there overhead, there, there hung over those thousands of white faces, those dazed eyes. There in the starless dark, the poise, the hover. There with vast wings across the canceled skies. There in the sudden blackness, the black pall of nothing, 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 nothing at all. I wanted to look at this poem briefly just to think about the way it moves from its octave to its sestet. In the octave, we're offered a metaphor, I believe, for the world, very much the world I think that William Wordsworth described in the previous poem when he says the world is too much with us. For Wordsworth, he evokes the moon and the sea and everything. But here, Archibald MacLeish decides that the world is like this crazy circus tent um, and we're all living underneath it. And absurd things are happening because I think that in MacLeish's view, the world is pretty absurd. So we get Madame Sussman having her neck bitten by a lion and Jocko being swung by the thumbs. That's pretty much our everyday life, I think is what MacLeish is saying. That's pretty much where we live. But the opening stanza asks this larger question which is what if the cloth roof of the circus tent that we all live in is suddenly and unexpectedly blown off? What then? What are we looking at? And you can hear how dramatically 
His voice changes as he comments on that in the sestet. That is, if the world is a circus of absurdity, then what is beyond the world, he suggests, might simply be the sudden blackness, the black pall of nothing, 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 nothing at all. And I think this poem implicitly, implicitly asks you, which one do you prefer? Because I'll take the circus myself. Um, this is also a fantastic poem. But the one thing I want you to notice, of course, is that it is an Italian sonnet in all ways, except that it ends with a rhyming couplet. So what do you have there? I think what you have there is a, um, a poem that manages to take advantage of that incredible final couplet, that final rhyme of Paul and all, which is so striking and at least to me kind of terrifying. I remember when I first encountered this poem when I was about 16 and it kind of blew my mind. And um, I remember walking around the house saying nothing, 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 nothing at all to myself because it, it seemed like such a wonderful sort of world canceling kind of kind of image. But, um, but you know, um, I think, I think that, that that implicit comparison is what drives this poem, the comparison between the world of, of this octave and the cancellation composed in quite a different voice, using a completely, to my ear, different kind of poetic music um, to talk about emptiness. So with that in mind, I wanted to spend maybe just a little bit more time on that emptiest of American poets, who is Robert Frost. I was taking a walk with a friend of mine when we were still allowed to take walks with friends. Um, and she was saying that she had heard or read somewhere um, that the Robert Frost that we all grew up with in high school, you know, the, the kind of sweet old farmer poet, isn't really a very accurate description of Robert Frost or his work. And I tend to agree with that. I think Robert Frost often seems to be a poet who wants to think about who appears on the surface to think about nature, you know, trees and old broken down farmers' walls and things like that. But in fact, um, he's a poet who is a great deal darker than that. I think of him as a poet a little bit more along the lines of Archibald MacLeish here with his meditation on the void and emptiness and godlessness. He is the man who I remember we said at one point in class suggested that we are creating the world in the act of observing it, moving, helping to move um, poetry into a kind of a modernism that was had par as part of its belief, this idea that we are all these sort of creating machines, that we walk around and sort of always create our own world, a very comforting um, idea in some ways, because it suggests that all of our worlds are different. What might be good for you is not good for me. What might be true for you isn't true for me either. I think that's an important thing um, and an important response to the kind of sentimentality that got the world into World War I and that I continue to see around us. But okay. Um, but of course, part of that idea, we create the world in the act of observing it, makes me at least ask, well, then what about the idea of the creator with a capital C? Like, what about that guy? I mean, if I'm always creating the, my world in the act of observing it, does that then cancel out the possibility of God? I think maybe it does. I mean, maybe not, but, but like, it seems to. Um, and does that then cancel out the idea of truth? That is, if we all are creating our own truths walking around, then maybe, so I mean, there's no such thing as a real truth out there, just truthiness? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know. It seems like that may be the case, but I think that those questions are very much at the heart of this poem, which, like the end of the world, is an Italian sonnet that has it both ways, that takes advantage of that final couplet, um, rhyming couplet. It's called Design. I found a dimpled spider, fat and white, on a white heel all, holding up a moth like a white piece of rigid satin cloth, Assorted characters of death and blight mixed ready to begin the morning right, like the ingredients of a witch's broth, a snowdrop spider, a flower like a froth, and dead wings carried like a paper kite. <laughs> 
What had that flower to do with being white? The wayside blue and innocent heal all. What brought the kindred spider to that height and steered the white moth thither in the night? What but design of darkness to appall? If design govern in a thing so small. Again, that final rhyming couplet of this Italian sonnet is really one of the most famous uh, in English language poetry, and I, I think justifiably. But first we have to get there. The poem begins with its octave. A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A is the rhyme scheme there. Um, in which the speaker says that he found a dimpled spider, fat and white. That is, he came across a spider um, and it was building a... Um, a web on a white heel all. A heel all, uh, by the way, is a flower that is typically blue. So this is a mutant heel all of some kind. Um, it's a white one. It's not, not the normal situation with heel alls. And, um, and he does this in order to catch a moth, right? And I think if we're workshopping this poem, I can, I can just imagine the workshop of this poem when it goes off the rails. Um, and the workshop of this poem gets a little bit, goes off the rails on that word white. If you listen to that opening octave, and I'm going to hold up my fingers for every time we either hit the word white or we hit on something that is white. I think we're going to see that it, 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 the, the, the octave is quite invested in this idea of white, especially for a poem that ends with its amazing final couplet on the word darkness. I found a dimpled spider, fat and white on a white heel all, holding up a moth. Moths are usually white, in my experience. Like a white piece of rigid satin cloth. Assorted characters of death and blight, mixed ready to begin the morning right. The right morning seems to me to be in the nice blinding white morning. Maybe I'm overstating it. Like the ingredients of a witch's bra, a snowdrop spider, a flower like a froth and dead wings carried like a paper kite. All right, we had eight lines and we had eight suggestions of the word white. So obviously white is thematic in this in this sonnet and the argument the sonnet is making in its nice eight line, six line construction. So I have to think, well, what, 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 why, why white? And why this insistence? And in the terrible workshop, somebody always says, I got the point about the white. You could maybe say it five times fewer times and we would still get it. And I would have to think, well, yeah, but I think that its insistence is important here. And the first thing I think is that white feels like feels like a word we often want to associate with purity, right? You know, a wedding gown is white. We like to say, oh, she's pure as the driven snow if we're into cliches. But um, so yeah, white, I think we can say white has something to do with purity. Um, white also has something to do with death though, of course. I mean, if your grandmother is sick in the hospital, you shouldn't bring her white flowers. Um, because she um, will probably recognize that white flowers are what go to a funeral, right? Um, white flowers are the death flowers. I don't think we think in those terms so much, but I think Robert Frost did. And um, I mean, maybe you hate your grandmother, in which case that would be appropriate. But otherwise, I wouldn't do that. Um, so I think of white is also a, a color that has something to do with death. And when I read that stanza, you know, he seems to say that there are assorted characters of death and blight mixed ready to begin the morning right. It sounds like a kind of a sarcastic thing to say, but I think he is saying at some level that, look, a spider builds a web, a moth comes by and gets caught in it, the spider eats the moth. It sounds kind of horrible, but it's also the cycle of life, right? That's how life works. If the spider doesn't get to eat the moth, then the spider doesn't get to live. So it's just, it's all part of how it works. It is in some ways right, right? It does have to do with the death, but I don't think we would call this like, I don't know, um, the black death, you know, the, uh, it's, 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 it's a pure kind of death. It's a system that works. It's a system that we're all part of. Okay. I mean, I think that's the kind of observation that opening stanza is making, whether it's making it earnestly or ironically is yet to be seen, but I think that's 
kind of where we are in that first stanza that, that we're observing the cycle of life and death and nature and we're thinking about its purity but also that it's a little bit you know a little bit scary i mean for the moth at the very least here we again stop in wordless silence between stanza one and stanza two while the mind of Robert Frost or whoever you imagine is thinking this poem or maybe you think they're telling this poem and they're pausing for dramatic effect. I feel like I'm understating that possibility a little bit. I mean sonnets often do have that feeling of a speaker who's pausing for dramatic effect. They're different but um, they're related. So if you want to think this is a pause or dramatic effect and not a pause of thinking, that's fine. But what I, I like the thinking one. He's pausing to think. And then he does something that I think most sonnets don't do. Instead of complicating stanza one, he instead lobs questions at it. I think the questions are where we had, want to start to, to think about how stanza two is thinking about what was just said in stanza one. The first question he asks is this, what had that flower to do with being white? The wayside blue and innocent heal all. It's an interesting question. I mean, quite literally, he's asking, why was that heal all, which would normally be blue, why was it white? Um, was it white just in order to signify to me that I was going to write a poem about death and purity? And I was going to be using that white a lot? I mean, probably not. I mean, I used to ask, you know, like, You've all seen me in front of class. I'm six foot four and devilish, devilishly handsome. What did I have to do with that? And I would just have to say, um, good genes, I guess, right? I didn't, I didn't have anything to do with it at all. A mutant white flower that would normally be blue doesn't have anything to do with its whiteness. It's just, it's an accident, right? It's an accident. Okay, that's the answer to the first question, at least for me. What brought the kindred spider to that height? and steered the white moth thither in the night. Well, I like to imagine, I mean, did the spider have like a tape measure and he tape measured his way up to to um, exactly where he had seen the moth come down that path five or six nights in a row and he thought, I'll get that bugger now? No, I don't think so. I think for the spider, just a kind of a wordless instinct kicks in and he builds his nest, his, I mean, his web at that kind of height because that that's the instinct and the moth, he's just fluttering. He didn't have anything to do with it. I mean, the answer to these questions are kind of nothing. You know, what did the flower do with being white? Nothing. What brought the spider to that height? Nothing, really. What steered the white moth? I guess nothing. Um, which leads me to start to ask this other question, which is that landscape he described in stanza one, it was all full of symbolism, white symbolism and, you know, and ha having us meditate on assorted characters of death and blight. What if all of that meaning that we imposed on that landscape existed really only in our own heads? We looked at a landscape that had nothing to do with us, that wasn't there to be meaningful to us or make meaning for us, and we just imposed a whole lot of meaning on top of it. What, what do we do to the landscape when we do that? I think that's part of the question here. The landscape wasn't white for us. The flower wasn't white for us. The spider didn't eat the moth for us, and yet we looked at it and created a whole big to-do about it. Well, here's the last question. What but design of darkness to appall? If design govern in a thing so small? Well, that seems to be the killer question because it's that final couplet. And as we've said before, the way sonnets are constructed creates the possibilities for their own arguments. What but design of darkness to appall is a scary question, actually, because it does seem to be a dark design, doesn't it? A design where, in order to keep going, the moth has to get eaten alive, right? And in some ways, can that be extrapolated to us, too? I mean, maybe it can. But if the design we live in and that we describe is what we just saw, and we're going to put that meaning on it, then we're going to have to talk about a design of darkness and a dark designer, um, which is to say, maybe a dark god would create a world 
like that, where in order for some people to be happy, other people have to be eaten alive. That's a dark designer. So what do, but design of darkness to appall? It is appalling. If design govern in a thing so small, well, the other op alternative here is that maybe design doesn't even govern in the world. Maybe there's just chaos. Maybe we're so impossibly far from God, according to Robert Frost, from the designer, that he doesn't even care about the moth or the spider to make any difference. And if we extrapolate from that, then where do we stand? Maybe in that same place? So the poem ends on these two options. Maybe it's a dark designer, or maybe we're too small to be part of the design. And neither of those sound like that nice country farmer that I went to high school and learned about. But I think that's who this really is and what this poem is really thinking about. And again, you can see that the way it is constructed allows for this incredibly complicated argument that offers us a world to interpret and it asks what right we have to interpret it or what kind of you know liberties we're taking with interpreting it and that offers us a clearer more clear-eyed vision in the final couplet it's an amazing poem and an amazing way of i think thinking about how the sonnet might work i want to get back to audrey rich for just one moment one of the things that audrey rich realized you know, at some point in her life, she began as a formalist poet, and she wrote lots and lots of sonnets and villanelles and things like that. And then at a certain point, she changed. It was a change that happened also for Gwendolyn Brooks, who wrote some of the greatest formal poems, traditionally formal poems, in the English language, as far as I'm concerned. And then she suddenly kind of stopped doing it. And I think for both of them, I think what they realized is Gwendolyn Brooks working... Um, who became politicized in the 60s and um, or you know more, more overtly had a political awakening let's just put it that way and um, decided that she was going to write for and to the african-american experience in a more activist sort of way and for audrey rich who did the same thing for women and gay people i think they both had a kind of a realization i'm going to paraphrase it badly here but i think the realization had to do with this that if you're going to make radical arguments that work radically against the status quo. Um, maybe the best way to do them is not within the architecture of poetic forms like sonnets that in some ways manipulate your argument into something a little bit more mainstream. That is, they had felt, I think, as though they had to break out of the restrictions of the sonnet in order to say what really needed to be said using the argument, argumentative architecture that was necessary to say it. So we're still with the sonnet, and I hope you'll write a sonnet um, and turn it in for your group. Um, and you can pick any kind of sonnet you want. I understand that the IMs are tricky for a lot of people. I know that's becoming in class. If you, you know, if you want to be loose with the IMs, be loose with the IMs. You want to be slanty with the rhymes, be slanty with the rhymes, but give it an honest attempt. And when you're writing it, don't just think of, I've got to obey all these different rules. Oh my God, I've got to have this rhyme and that rhyme and blah, blah, blah. But think in terms of the larger architecture that we're talking about. That is what kind of arguments can be made or what kind of thoughts can be expressed using eight lines and six lines or four, 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 two. Or if you want to pick up on this Robert Frost or Archibald McLeish sort of hybrid, that too. All right. Thanks a lot. Looking forward to talking to each of you on the phone about your sonnets. I hope you'll contact me if you need help or have concerns or anything. Um, and I'm going to try to get this thing uploaded. And here you go, only half a glass of wine drunk. I'll finish it up all by myself. Bye for now.